Here's the danger about this service is there's no service after this one. And so all clocks off. <laughs> I'm just going to go for it. But I'm excited to be back. And as Scott said, man, I'm thankful for Scott, your leadership to our organization, to our church, to Gospel Life Church. Uh, thank you for, for leading and training and raising us to be more like Jesus and to grow in our gifts. And, and with that, we get to see that exemplified in, in many leadership capacities. And uh, I thank Pastor Austin, too, who leads this campus, the hard work he's put into it to, uh, to lead you all. He preached such a good word last week. And so he brought the gift, he wrapped the gift, and I just kind of put, get to put the bow on the gift uh, today because we're going to talk about marriage again. But as Scott said, what, is, what we are as a church uh, is, is raising next generations, and we keep the gospel very central to who we are, to what we do. Uh, and this week, I had a chance through one of our partnerships, as we talked about through Meant for More, uh, our mission side of this, uh, how we support our local ministries and why that makes sense to us. Just this week, I had a chance to go and, and preach there at Larkin High School uh, in Elgin, uh, and there was through that partnership with Decision Point. Decision Point is a local ministry here where they get the gospel into public schools, Christian start Christian uh, clubs on grounds in their public school, and they get to say and preach the name of Jesus. And that was really cool. So I got a chance to do that uh, just this week, Wednesday. Uh, as I get back, we have a meeting where we sit in and we talk about kind of our professional and our personal wins. And my professional win this week was only because of the Spirit of God, not because of anything I'd done, because the gospel is true and it rewards. Uh, I went and preached, and there I got a message about 20 minutes into our meeting. Six students committed their life to Jesus. Twelve students rededicated their life to Jesus. Amen. And it's because when we talk about what we do as a church, it is because of you all allow us to propel the mission of God forward, uh, to share the gospel, to be the gospel to uh, each other in our communities that we multiply gospel blessings. And here's what I want. I want heaven to be full. <laughs> and so let's just keep doing that as a church, as missions, as God has called us to. So uh, I'm excited today to share, as Scott said, family's doing great, three kids, a wife who is perfect, although I am not, and we'll talk about that in, in the message uh, as well. Uh, I remember painting at Moody Bible Institute, and this guy pulled me aside, and he says, Tay, there's three rings to, to a relationship. There's the engagement ring, there's the wedding ring, and then there's suffering. <laughs> <laughs> and you can decide which ones you give to your wife. <laughs> Today, as I said, Austin did such a great job. Today, we're going to continue on in part two. Uh, of marriage. And over the past several weeks, we've walked through portions and selections of the Proverbs that really has been rich and practical to who we are in our faith and as Christians. Uh, and I believe that if you think about who wrote the Proverbs, King Solomon writing these wise wor words to his son, the, the aim was to reinforce kind of these essential truths of the one who created wisdom. And how we are to walk in that wisdom and grow in that skill. For the one who created wisdom that knows all wisdom, like it's good when we do things God's way. And when we deeply discover and when we begin to develop in every facet of our life that God's way is the right way, I think we will be surely to embody and embrace the instructions that God has given us for all seasons of life. Because what it does for us, when we do things God's way and in his wisdoms, we talked about this, we use this word shattering, what it allows us to do is shatter the very algorithms, the various things of the world, the culture of our own ideologies, of our own self that we say, hey, I want to live right this rather than what God calls me to do. We, when we do it God's way, it frames for us his way. And what God has given us are simple formulas to answering life's biggest questions and how to solve some of life's biggest problems. Friends, marriage is, is one of those where it's joys and it's good and it's sorrows and it's joys and it's good and it's, it's struggles. And what we dare not do is order our lives after the algorithms of the world. When you think about marriage, both the world and the scriptures have something to say about it. Th think about it. The world says marriage will be always, always and forever, nice and easy, like you're dazing through a bed of roses and flowers 
and the mimosas are flowing, and it's great. And then you end cap it with a little bit of happily ever after. Or, or how about the one? The one is just out there. You seek, you find that all that you do, you find the one. The one is going to complete you. The one is going to make you happy. Do as you will with the one. Right? It gives you the chills, and they're multiplying, and you're losing control. Because the power, you're simply, it's electrifying. So you better shape up because you got to be the man. She need a man. And in your heart, you got to be true because you're the one that I want. Woo, hoo, hoo. <laughs> right? I mean, look, the one is there. Or how about this? You can devalue marriage. The world says devalue marriage. Why in the world would you X, Y, Z? Why, why would you submit to headship and authority? And submission. Why would you honor each other with all you have, your gifts and your talents and your character? Why in the world would you put your finances with his finances and put your finances with her finances and live to honor each other? The world devalues marriage in every sense. Did God really ordain it or is it all about your happiness? The world says that, man, you can just be kind of partners, friends with benefits, living under this covenant of marriage with no, with no proper view of what sex is to God and how he created this such great gift. Or when temper, temptations, and trials begin to enter into your relationship, those are all exit doors for you to leave. The world says that's what you live by. The word says, but what God has put together, let no man separate what God has created, let no man take away. The marriage bed should be kept holy and pure. And that earthly marriages, here's my big thrust for today, that earthly marriages are both a mirror and a reflection of Christ, of love, of sacrifice, of commitment, of unity to each other. Marriage is designed to uniquely display God's covenant to us. And it goes far beyond just this vivid imagery of God loving us so deeply, which is important. But it comes back that he loves us so deeply that he will be the very perfect groom to a very imperfect bride, you and I, his church. And in spite of that, he will come back and make us whole and complete and pure, and we will have the greatest reception in the world when he comes back and take us home. I'll get to that later. Proverbs chapter 24 is kind of where I want to start. I'm going to bounce around here in the book. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 3, when you think about what do I follow? Is there a way to marry? Absolutely. Matter of fact, it's by wisdom. To understand, the skill, to, to grow in him by wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding, it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Here, wisdom does not just build a house, but it also fills it and prospers it and make it happy. Now, when I talk about prosperity there, I'm not talking about the grander, the bigger, the health, and the wealth, but when you do God's way, God rewards us for doing that. He makes things joyful. He, he, he brings pleasures that we get to enjoy. It's by wisdom doing it in the way the Lord has already ordered. The use of wisdom is essential for marriages. It's important. It's not just about building the house, building your household. It brings security and prosperity, but it's also an outpouring of you and I, for those who, who are married, we want to honor the Lord with all that we have and please him. In marriage, it's strong, it's established, it, it roots up the very things that are meant to grow and not destroy it. Just this week, we, we put together a little pool for our kids and we put all the little pieces together and we, it came in a box, we took out the box and took it out the box and there was a book, a manual, Right? A manual to put a pool together is a manual the way we live our life. And, and one of the things that's said about this pool is, is when you put it in, put it on a, on, a, on a sure foundation, make sure it's level, make sure there's no aggressive grass. I'm like, what is aggressive grass? <laughs> like, what? Aggressive grass. Meaning, if you put it on aggressive grass, there will be weeds and roots that will grow up through the bottom of your pool, the very structures you put together. I begin to think, in our marriages, for those who are married, 
If we don't build upon a great structure, we may think we got the frame together, we got the house in order, you got your 17 throw pillows on your bed, the house is always clean, you got your two dogs, but oh, if we don't put the right structure after God's way, those roots will soak in and they will ruin, ruin the very structures we are meant to enjoy. That should bring God's pleasure. In a sense, it's a mirror that God will use you as a spouse to help chisel to help kind of uh, uh, guide your, your spouse into more of a sanctification process to, mo- to look more like Jesus. God uses that person even more than anybody in our lives. But then also it's a reflection. It's a reflection that we don't get it right all the time, that we're not perfect at it, that we will fail at it, but there will be one because of his great love for us, with which he's already exemplified through Jesus Christ, will come back and usher us into a perfect wedding ceremony, which I'll get to uh, later. But, but here's what I want to tell us today, is God has created, ordained, and defined marriage. He's already did. So we don't have to worry about any of the other algorithms of the world, of the culture, of your day, of what you think it's right, or what was passed down to you. God has already ordained it. He created it, and he defines it. M- marriage is not something that cavemen set together around a fire with a rabbit that they killed with a boomerang and said, hey, let's talk about marriage, guys. Yes, that's a good idea. No, no, God had created it. Matter of fact, he designed it and arranged it with Adam and Eve, did he not? When you go back to the Genesis account and you look at the, the foundation and the backdrop of the story in chapter 2 and then in chapter 3, where God said, it's a good thing. It's a good thing to where you should not be alone. And so he created for him a spouse, a, a helper. But then sin, of course, entered into the world. And where there are many, many wrong illustrations of marriage in the Bible, I think the one that speaks of at the end is the glory of marriage of God speaks of how he would then enter into brokenness and make everything right. Because here's the truth. Everything God says is good. The enemy says it's bad. Anything God creates to be good, the evil one wants to make sure he puts a spin on it. We live by our own devices and our own rules, and you can do as you wish. Did he not do that in the garden? Does he still not do that now? God has already created the covenant of marriage. Matter of fact, he designed for our marriages to be an intimate companionship to counteract loneliness. And since God is three equal persons, he's designed for our marriages in which husbands and wives are equally dignified. There is no sense, dear sister, that you are lesser, dear man, that you are greater. No, it's equally dignified. It represents him. Since God is diverse and complementary, uh, he created marriage to be diverse and wonderfully complementary. There's some things that I do well. There's some things that I don't do well, and it's a lot of it, and Samantha does it well for me. (laughs) It's supposed to complement. It's supposed to work together. It's supposed to be in perfect union. And guess how God created that? He created that in a heterosexual union, not a homosexual union. He created it in which God has joined male and female together to be wonderfully diverse and complementary. And so, friends, Christian marriage reflects the gospel in that a husband and a wife will love each other even though they are imperfect. Even though they are imperfect because God has shown this love for each of them and they are motivated by grace to love one another. It ain't perfect. I'm not always kind. I always want to be right. When two sinners come together, here's the thing marriage will reveal to us is that we are both sinners in need of a savior and grace every day imperfect. Tim Tim Keller says this, rest his soul, Tim Keller went to be with Jesus this week, and just a sharp mind, Dr. Tim Keller, he says this, it's a little lengthy, so bear with me. He says this, in sharp contrast with our culture, the Bible teaches that the essence of marriage is a sacrificial commitment to the good of that other person. That means that love is more fundamentally action than emotion. But in talking this way, there is a danger of falling into the opposite error that characterized many ancient traditional societies. 
It is possible to see marriage as a merely social transaction, a way of doing uh, life or duty to your family or to your tribe or to your society. Traditional societies made the family the ultimate value in life, and so marriage was a mere transaction that helped your family's interest. By contrast, contemporary Western societies make the individual's happiness the ultimate value, and so marriage becomes much more of an experience of a romantic fulfillment. He says, but the Bible sees God as the supreme good, not the individual, not the family, not the husband, not the wife, but it gives a view that intimately unites both feelings and duty and passion and promise. And here, here's the main part of this. This is because the heart of a biblical idea of marriage is the covenant, a union, a uniting, a loving, a bonding that gets outside of us, that, that, that when we are not right, because we won't always be, the Lord comes in and he, he show, showers grace and mercy upon that. The aim of Christian marriage, the aim of marriage is that we grow in Christ-like love. Will it ever be perfect? Absolutely not. I do wake up every morning and say, good morning, Samantha Perfect Mitchell. And she says, yes, good morning, imperfect big head. No, I'm just kidding. It will never be right. Your spouses will never possess all the perfections of their gender. There are differences. You like the music loud. I like it quiet. When you get up in the morning, you think you're silent, but every pot and pan and door is slamming while I'm sleeping. You like the room cold and dark. You like it Warm with 13 blankets. You like it with 17 throw pillows on the bed. You leave the toothpaste cap open. <laughs> There's all these differences. J- just this week, I'm leaving for work on Tuesday. And I yell up, Good. all right, babe, we'll see you later. Love you, bye. Love you too. Take out the trash. <laughs> the trash that for two days I've left sitting there. <laughs> like, those are not things you exit out of, of, of marriage. It's a beautiful union. So here's what I want to cover. In marriage, man and woman change, but their promises does not, and they are sustained by God who enacted his covenant between Christ and the church. So I want to walk, us, walk away today <clears throat> by answering this question. How do I keep my marriage? How do you keep your marriage in gospel focus? How do you keep it in gospel focus? of love, sacrifice, commitment, unity. Number one, I believe it's seek counsel over isolation. Seek counsel over isolation. Whether you're single or married, I think we all have this tendency. When we are hurt, when we are not heard, we all clam up. We all work the narrative through our head. Like, let me get this story right, and then I'm getting ready to go and unleash these words on him or her. (laughs) And what happens is we get in isolation. And because we are broken, because we are imperfect, because we are sinners, what happens is that narrative begins the winds. Uh, Proverbs 18, one, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desires. (laughs) Ain't that the truth? I want to always be right. I want to always win. He breaks out against all sound judgments. Everything you ever learned is now out the window. When you stay in that period of isolation, when the going gets tough, or the disagreement is is, is heated and heavy, the scripture says, no, 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 seek counsel. Seek wise counsel. Those who will be in your corner, who, yes, you can pick up the phone or text, or it's a neighbor, or someone in your small group that will speak words that are true and holy, that exemplify the whole piece of Scripture, that help bring change, not confusion and more conflict. Not that everyone needs to be in your Kool-Aid and don't know the flavor. Absolutely not. Some of the people you trust that help you navigate through those things. Don't isolate yourself. Seek counsel over isolation. That's how you keep gospel in focus. But then also you serve each other with gladness. You serve each other with gladness. Uh, Proverbs chapter 12 Proverbs 12, verse 18. There is one whose rash words are like sore thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Choose to serve that spouse out of the overflow of joy 
and gladness, even when it's hard, even when you can't. Proverbs 16, 24. Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. Serve out of gladness. The Lord revealed this to me, and I got permission to share the story. Last week, we don't get into many disagreements in my household, but when we do, it's Godzilla, <laughs> and I'm not Godzilla, <laughs> and get ready. You will hear it. And so we got into one, and I was hurt, and I was wrong. Hear me, I was wrong, <laughs> and I was bitter. And I served out of being a sinner instead of serving out of gladness and joy. This disagreement, it wasn't right in my eyes. I didn't feel like I was hurt. I felt like I was saying everything right. But man, I did not serve. And, and God also will send these children in your life to help sanctify you. And it's in that moment where God sent my little four-year-old to speak a word of, yeah, you're right, bro, we got to forgive and we got to own up when we mess up. And we got to keep short accounts. We got to forgive. As Pastor also said, because we've been forgiven much, we do got to forgive. And then we got to sit on a hot seat and say, hey, I'm sorry. Let me, let me serve you now out of gladness. Here's 55 bucks. Go get your nails and hair done. <laughs> Just kidding. It's much more than 55 bucks. <laughs> but serve out of gladness. Not, not out of the rooting of that sin that's going to uh, show itself. But then with that, you've got to seek to reconcile. Search your hearts. Search your hearts, friends, to reconcile. Here's why Jesus himself did this best for you and I. I'll get to that in just a little bit. Jesus himself then came to reconcile, to bring us back to God the Father. Search in your hearts to reconcile. Proverbs 17:9. For whoever covers an offense seeks love, but the one who repeats a matter separates close friends. There's a sense, man, I, I got to get it right. Or, or 17, 3, uh, 13. If anyone returns evil for good, evil will not depart from your house. It ain't worth it to keep going in that cycle. <laughs> Maybe you do need a day. Maybe you do need a couple hours. But seek in your heart. That's how you keep your marriage as a gospel focus. That is just temporary here on earth. That when you get to heaven, our gaze will be fixed on something else. But while we're here on earth, reflect the very thing Jesus has done for us with and in your marriage and to your spouse. Don't return evil for evil. Seek, search your hearts to reconcile. And then number four is stay married. Like, realize marriage is built to endure. Now, let me pause there for a minute. Because I get, if you look at Genesis chapter 3, sin has entered into the world and has tainted and broken everything. So I get there are some things in the marriage that is hurtful. There is some abuse that happens in marriages. And if that's you in the room, hear me, I am sorry. That should not take place, whether it's male or female. Your physical body should not be touched and harmed. And if that's someone here, we would love to talk to you as a pastoral staff. Or maybe you are in the marriage and this continual trail of, of, of unfaithfulness has keep happening over and over again. Some of those moments are very hard. And when you hear stay marriage, you may think, man, no one understands me. We want to draw near with you in those moments. But, but I believe all of these things that are hardships outside of those things does not give us the license to go and exit. There is this sense of permanence, this sense that Jesus Christ will, when he comes back, when he comes back from heaven, comes back to earth and take all his church up, it, not, it won't just be for a little vacation. He won't just say, hey, you got to enjoy a little bit of this, now enter back into the earth. Absolutely not. It is this sense of permanence. He shows that to us, so we should show that to our spouse. Stay married. As a husband and wife, I love this quote, as a husband and wife pursue the gospel as their goal, they will go closer than a husband and wife who is focused solely on their own happiness. It puts it all in perspective. And when it's hard, talk it out. Maybe you do need to go counseling. Maybe you do got to change some rhythms and places. 
But see that as a commitment because the death of Christ upon a cross was for his bride, church, was for you and I, and that was such an ultimate commitment. And what he promises is that, we may even call those his vows, that he will come back and return to her, that he will come back and take us up and be with him, that he will bring us to himself throughout all eternity, John 14, 18. He says that no one will be able to snatch his people out of his hand in John 10, 28. And he says that he will be with her even until the end of the age in Matthew 28. And then he promises to make her spiritually pure. It's a model. And if marriage is designed to show Christ's love and devotion to the church, and singleness is designed to show the church's love and devotion to Christ, marriage seems to uniquely highlight the love and devotion of Christ to his church seen in the love and devotion between a husband and a wife. Let me, let me illustrate that a little more. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5. E- Ephesians chapter 5, 25. Let me read this to you. You don't have to turn there. Husbands, love your wives as Christ has loved the church. And he gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself. Not that we're perfect and right. We're imperfect, but he's going to do what? He's going to revive us. He's going to make us new in splendor, without a spot or a wrinkle or such or anything, that she might be holy and without blemish. And in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Christ has shown us that. How about a Second Corinthians? Second Corinthians five twenty one. Maybe maybe you have this tattooed on your arm, or it's your memory verse. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the very righteousness of God. Sacrifice, commitment to the very end. Jesus entered in all that was broken. Yep, let's go there. Philippians chapter 2. See if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any uh, affection and sympathy. Complete my joy being the same mind, having the same love, being in full of cord in one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. But each of you look not only at your own interests, but also the interests of others. Having this mind among yourself, what is this mind? This mind that was in Christ Jesus, what is this mind that's in Christ Jesus? Humility and self-giving and sacrifice. Who though was in the form of God, hold up, wait a minute. The very best gift came from the gift that was given to us through God himself, his son. He was in the form of God, creator, sustainer, ruler of all things. And what did he do next? Did not count himself equality with God as the thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. He put it all down that he may take on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man and being found in human form. He humbled himself, being obedient even to the point of death, death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. He did it right. He bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. What does it reflect? What does our marriages reflect, friends? This, Christ himself giving up everything to make us restore back to the Father. And guess what? The greatest reception the greatest wedding is going to be when both the singles and the married are there in heaven worshiping him forever. When I get to heaven, I won't look across and just look at Sam and say, hey girl, let's hold hands one more time. Let's get one more cuddle. Oh, no, no, no. It's going to be the king who has redeemed me, who has saved me, who brought salvation to all of us will now be the very focus of what we worship. Marriage reflects this. And so we praise him for what he's done. Because God has never been in a situation that he cannot solve. That God has never been a, seen a sinner that he cannot save. That God has never seen a sinner that can save himself. And God would never send another substitute to save us but his son Jesus. It reflects such a beautiful picture. And the perfect marriage, the perfect marriage will be when the groom Christ comes back for his bride. And we will worship him forever. We think King Charles had a coordination. Wait until this one happens. Wait until he comes back. And the hardships we endured, 
the ongoing tensions we've endured will all be complete. It will be the greatest and complete consummation we will ever see. And some would say, man, that's pretty reckless. Why, why would he do that in Philippians 2? Why would he empty himself? Because of love he has for you and I. And so whatever stage of life you're in, in your singleness, in your marriage, let's model it well. Let's model the very picture that Christ so great loved us that he came to be with us. And he came to redeem us and to restore us. How do you keep your marriage in gospel focus? Good counsel, not isolation. Serve. See the good in each other. Keep short accounts. Realize you want to reconcile and stick to it. If you can, stick to it. The Lord blesses that. Wisdom house is built. It's established. And so in a world that says you can have it any other way, that you can build your own path to it, I believe the devil is a lie. And what we need to do is take back these marriages, is take back these foundations. I think about in First King where Elijah is praying. He's like, Lord, it feels like all these other guys, are, these other uh, folks are buying da- bowing down to this Baal guy. And so now I'm frustrated. Should I give up? And God says, no. There's 7,000 people who are fighting this good fight. Friends, you are not alone. I don't know how many people are in this room or the other service we've been at, but you are not alone in the fight. That your marriages, that your life, and all that we're doing is to reflect him and bring him honor and glory be formed into his likeness, not of our own. And so I want to pray that God give you the strength, the courage, the faith, the stick to it to get it done until we all meet up in the middle of the year and worship our King, King forever. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the blessings that we do get to enjoy here on earth in many ways. And marriage is one of those. Lord, thank you that even in our imperfections and our wrongs, Lord, that you exemplify it to us of how you've come to make it right and how you've made it right and how you've forgiven and how you've shadowed us with this great cloud of of love. And so, Lord, for the family, the couple that are either in stage one where it is just still bubbling over and it's great or in stage two that's just kind of mediocre or in stage three where it's like old bread on a counter and it's stale and moldy. But would you enter right now into the situation? May, may, may the husband and wife make the commitment to see this great beautiful covenant and union and love and if they have children or grandchildren and or nieces and nephews, or to a dying world, Lord, that they, that they get to see that. But Lord, it won't be done by our own work. It won't be done by our own self. But we are all prone to wonder. We are all prone to, to do our own thing. And I pray, Lord, that you keep us ever faithful, that you keep us ever true to you, loving, forgiving, walking in you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what seemed to be so reckless was so rewarding that you would empty of everything you have to put on human flesh. Now to call us righteous sons and daughters of God because of your great love for us. Thanks for forgiving us and calling us to yourself. And Lord, oh, we can't wait. May we do have an opportunity to look future focus of when we'll be caught up with Jesus. We worship you all of our days for eternity and eternity because of your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen.